So now we're coming to theories of, uh, success, uh, of how we actually age well. So um, calorie restriction has been around for a long time. And so this is a famous picture of two velvet monkeys. The monkey on, the, uh, on, your, on, the, on your right, on the screen's right, a bit on, on that side, your, your right, um, has had free calories and able to eat as much as he wanted to. This, cal this monkey has been kept on 30% on, on, uh, of the uh, average requirement for a monkey. And this monkey is much healthier, has free of cardiovascular disease, but if you have a look at the haunted look on the monkey's face, <laughs> he's not a happy monkey. <laughs> so while calorie restriction does make a difference, and we actually understand the mechanism whereby uh, calorie restriction makes you live longer, it's not really practical. Um, and so, um, we know the theory behind that is that there is there's something called mTOR signaling, which, um, uh, which is a, um, a genetic a DNA sequence, uh, which, um, uh, which conserves the energy. Basically, it slows down the metabolic rate uh, of the cell. And so if you take a, a yeast worm um, uh, and you measure uh, and you inhibit mTOR by an enzyme, basically uh, the yeast worm lives longer because it signals uh, in response to dietary restriction the cell to take steps to conserve energy. And you're, at least in a fruit fly, you have to, uh, you have to a fruit worm, uh, uh, yeast worm flies, I beg your pardon. You have to reduce it by 20, you have to reduce the uh, calorie intake by 25%. By stressing the, um, the, the body, the body recognizes it at least, uh, and probably in humans, but certainly in animals and certainly in, um, in insects and in, in mice as well. The mTOR signaling uh, cytokine is the, is the mechanism whereby it, this uh, calorie restriction works. So obviously, now that you've identified um, the mech one of the reason, one of the, um, the the steps whereby calorie restriction works, is it possible to inhibit mTOR, uh, the mTOR cytokine in ways other than starving yourself? Well, there's tons of candidates uh, along this, and the two that are best um, uh, the two that are best known one is called rapamycin, and the other one is called resver resveratrol. And these are um, uh, the, the um, those are uh, drugs which have the um, the reputation uh, and the at least in animal models to actually inhibit the mTOR cytokine to do that. And if you go online and you Google it, you will find many people wanting to sell to sell you rapamycin resveratrol offline, uh, off, off off label. And for, I'd, I'd, I'd advise you not to get involved in that because while it might work for fruit flies and it might work for rats, um, it hasn't been tried in humans. Um, and so, um, but uh, so rapamycin extended the expected lifestyle in middle in middle age ra uh, uh, mice by twenty eight percent to thirty eight percent, and again would inhibit it. And the reason I put it, I put rapamycin, if I put um, a picture of the, um, of the statues on the Easter Island is because suitably exotic uh, rapamycin is a yeast only found on Easter Island. So resveratrol is the red wine. So, uh, so, and that's one of the reasons why red wine is reputed to be uh, good for you. Uh, several, and, and so uh, resveratrol mimics several of the biochemical effects of calorie restriction. Again, a red resveratrol extends the lifespan of fruit flies, nematode worms, uh, and short-lived uh, fish, and is found in red wine. But realistically, you'd have to have something like 30 or 40 bottles of red wine a day to get sufficient amounts of resveratrol. So while people might try, I suspect it won't be very effective. So what about taking resveratrol as a supplement, and that's available? Unfortunately, that doesn't work. It hasn't worked in studies so far. So we're still in the early phases of understanding. We, we've come a long way in understanding how, how senescence occurs, how we age. We are getting some clues about how this process can be manipulated 
the problem so far is we haven't been able to translate that knowledge into into therapies that are useful in human beings, useful and or safe and or useful. So uh, we, as of the 30th of May 2012, uh, we are uh, left with uh, we have what we have, and every day we all of us get get older. How can we? A, how can each of us take control? of our future and uh, live, uh, uh, how can each of us um, live uh, successful aging? How can we, what, what things can we do to age successfully? And basically in the last 24, 25 years that I've been doing geriatrics, I've seen people who are healthy uh, at 90, um, but with disability, and the people who look pretty good on paper, but are total, you know, wrecks at 65. What's the, what's the secret? And so um, th there are four uh, components, uh, and we'll talk about them uh, each in turn. The first one would be risk modification. Um, in other words, the things that we, um, that we all know about. So would be, um, would be controlling your blood pressure, uh, having an ideal body weight, uh, would be the, if we have elevated cholesterol and other risk factors to take steps to deal with it and not to smoke um, to avoid high-risk activities and to have a prudent lifestyle um, the second component is luck is luck because you know I'm afraid if you 80 or 82 <coughs> and you're gonna get some terrible disease I'm afraid you're out of luck because you know you, you just have chosen you know the short end of the straw so clearly a big component of successful aging is luck. And so when you see people, you know, when they turn 100 or some milestone and they get asked, what's your secret to successful aging? And they say stuff like, well, I just rub a clove of garlic on my head every day or whatever. <laughs> and basically what it means is people have been colossally lucky and they've never had to confront a challenge. They've just, they've dodged all the bullets and it's wonderful because the, and it's terrific. But the really admirable people are the people who are able to deal with adversity. Those are the people who really deserve our, I mean, deserve our respect. You know, because the, they are really, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to, to not have challenges. It's a completely another thing to have challenges and overcome them. <coughs> the third component which may or may not be um, may or may or may or may not be um, uh, treatable or do anything about is your personality. What type of personality do we have? I mean, are we indecisive, know-it-all, agreeable, a complainer, silent, aggressive, or negativist? And so, I mean, that's really what we're born with, uh, which I suppose might be luck or whatever. But it's I mean, really, you know, personality has such a tremendous comp uh, outlook uh, in how you deal with adversity. You know, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Is it possible to learn to do new things? You know, so often we see, I see people who clearly aren't doing well. Uh, and they're living at home and they're falling and, you know, they're, they're losing weight. And it's clear that there's a problem at home. And you say to them, well, you know, and they've got real reason for, for all their problems because of physical limitation. And you say to them, you know, you're not managing, you've got all these problems, let's put in a homemaker. And they say, no, I can't have anybody in my house. And I say, well, this person would come and you'd get to know them and they're bonded and blah, blah, blah. You know, no, I can't have anybody in my, house, in my house. I just couldn't. You say, well, I understand that, but you realize if you continue doing the same old, same old, what you've been doing has been failing. If you continue to do that, if you continue along this path, you're going to land up in a nursing home and you're going to lose all your independence. And somehow they can't make that, they can't connect the dots. And what I tell people is that sometimes by accepting help, you retain your independence. Some people can, can accept that and some people can't. Because initially when you say that, it seems like a contradiction in terms. If you accept help, you retain your independence. By accepting help with small things, but you know, the big things remain independent. The people who are able to accept that and operationalize it tend to do much better. What determines that ability to do that, um, I'm not sure. Uh, probably personality. An example of that is hearing. So I'm pretty sure that you know I'm getting to be of an age when I'm losing my hearing and most if we had an audiology lab uh, testing in this uh, outside and everybody signed up I'm pretty sure 90-95% of this audience 
would have sensorineural hearing loss, loss of high frequency. And so inevitably, uh, your children or, or would say, you know, mom or dad, you're getting deaf. Or, you know, sp and you'll say, speak up, I can't hear you. Or you'd have to say, could you say it again? And then they'll say, well, get a hearing aid. And they'll say, well, I don't want a hearing aid, I'm just going to wait. If you just spoke louder, I wouldn't. Or I can hear the news fine, so why do I need a hearing aid? Um, or as long as there's no background noise, I can hear. And I'm not going to have a hearing aid because blah, 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 blah. That's very common. Um, and then eventually what happens when you, when the people get to be 80 or 85, eventually you give in to your, to you know, people who, who, who are nagging you or whatever, or you decide maybe it's time to get it. And guess what? You spend $1,000 or $1,500, you get a bright new hearing aid, you put it in your ear, and then after, then it whistles and it irritates and it's uncomfortable and the battery goes flat and then you drop the battery and you can't fiddle around. And then after three weeks, you get fed up and you put it in the bedside table and it spends, spends its life in a bedside table. And so what I've learned is that the, you, know, you see people who use hearing aids and they use them all the time, even in noisy environments. And you say, when did you start using a hearing aid? And you say, I used it, I started using it in my 40s and 50s and 60s. Because it turns out learning to, to, having, to, learning to use a hearing aid is very hard work. You have to have an adaptable brain, which has to exclude background noise. And you have to learn to, um, to uh, concentrate and, and lip read. And it's hard work. Plus, you have to have the physical dexterity to actually manipulate the stupid thing. And so, um, if you're much more likely to be able to use it when you're, if you start getting adapted to it. So, I always tell people, use a hearing aid earlier rather than later because only good things are going to happen. Similarly with the cane, when, you're, when your gait is starting to be a problem um, and you're not walking as fast and you're restricting your, um, your activities because, you know, clearly because of balance or because of pain, you're much better off using a cane or a walker and, work, and walking further and, far and, f and faster with more confidence than sort of walking short distances with lack of confidence. That's an example of, of, of taking an aid to using your independence, but to, to, to maintain your independence. Those are, those are two examples which I use. Easy to say and hard to do. I realize people don't, there's a stigma attached to having a hearing aid and there's a stigma attached to, uh, to a cane, um, but the people who are able to recognize that and you know, suck it up and do it tend to do better. And that's probably, you know, the most important, well, the second most important message that um, that I have that today is to is to uh, is to adapt as much as one as possible, rather than try and fight it. And people say, oh well, this person is fiercely independent. Fiercely independent is good, but bad, good in one sense, but terrible in another sense if it precludes making any adaptations. So. This is a, a terrific example that I saw at the Falls Clinic. This is an 88-year-old gentleman seen in the Falls Clinic who had a fall and he, which actually resulted in a fracture of his L1. He was a World War II vet and he had severe sensory neural hearing loss. He was in, um, he was in um, artillery and from the noise exposure. He had a grossly unstable right knee. He had adrenal insufficiency, so he was on long-term cortisone. He had terrible back pain from spinal stenosis. He uh, had back surgery times two with terrible back pain. He had had a big heart attack which left his heart with a big ventricular aneurysm and poor balance and walker dependent. And you think, oh my goodness, you look at this man with a, a big heart that's likely to pop and spinal stenosis, who's deaf, who's got an unstable knee and his back pain has just fallen. And yet this man was just you know, he was, he was adaptable, he was optimistic, he had restricted his activities. You know, I said, are you depressed? He said, no, should I be depressed? He was tough. So whatever he had, we should bottle it. Because it's really magic and it's really inspiring. Despite all the disability and all the challenges that he had, he was completely uh, functional. So, so it really goes to show you, it's not what you have, but how you deal with the disability that makes the difference. So the final thing, we can't control luck. Um, we, uh, we, can, we, we, can, we can have a, life, a healthy lifestyle, and most of us do. Um, we can't control luck. We can try to be adaptable. 
uh, to our lifestyle. We, we try to be adaptable and try to accept help and work with the constraints of our personality and recognize that. One thing we all can do is an effective exercise program. You know, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him exercise. You can, you can ask people to exercise and facilitate it, but people who don't want to exercise won't. And there's always a reason why you won't exercise, and there's always a good reason why you won't exercise. But somehow the people who want to exercise do. And when you talk about exercise, it doesn't mean that you have to do the exercise that you were doing 30 and 40, 50 years ago. It's what, what you can do to, to, to learn to live within the disability. Um, and so that's really the, the most important mechanism. One little caveat with that is people overestimate the exercise that they do. You know, I'm always, I'm always active. I don't need to exercise because I'm always active. I look, I look after the house. I, I'm up and down the stairs all the day. I'm, always, I'm up and down the steps all day, the flight of stairs in my house. Or I'm on my feet all day. I never sit down. That's true, and, it, and it's certainly true, but that's not actually exercise. Exercise is exercise for, um, for, for exercise sake. And people way uh, overestimate how much exercise they do. Um, uh, people say gardening is exercise. Well, not really. It might be terrific for your spirits, and it's wonderful to be outside, and it's a, t a wonderful hobby. But you know, but you know, putting around and pulling out weeds is not really exercise. <laughs> and so, certainly, you should do that. So, how much? So, what's the goal for exercise? So, um, the National Institute of Health recommend, uh, uh, recommends two and a half hours a week of designated time for exercise, which is 30 minutes five times a week of exercise. The intensity of exercise should be uh, moderate. So what's moderate, uh, what's moderate uh, uh, intensity? Moderate intensity is um, uh, you slightly breath, you can talk, but you're slightly breathless. You can't talk long sentences, but you can certainly talk. That's what moderate intensity is. So if you sort of having a gentle stroll and you're talking a breeze and you don't even notice you're walking, that's not moderate intensity. So, so to get the benefit of exercise is moderate intensity, 30, uh, two and a half hours a week, 30 minutes, five times a week. And it turns out that there are four types of exercises. There's endurance or, 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 or cardiovascular fitness, uh, strength, balance and flexibility. And a, uh, an exercise program needs to, um, uh, needs, to in, needs to have cover all of them. Um, and so an exercise program over the lifespan is endurance or cardiovascular exercise for the first 50 years is very important. So um, what we usually is, um, associate with exercise, running or uh, riding or um, uh, swimming or cycling, um, would be anything that gets your heart rate up and you sweat and you're breathless, is very important for the first 50 years of your life. That controls your blood pressure, prevents cardiovascular disease, uh, prevents diabetes, maintains your weight, um, controls high blood pressure, all the benefits of cardiovascular exercise. From 50 to 75, we need to start doing resistance exercises or strength exercises. Because what happens once we, after approximately 50, sometimes a bit earlier, sometimes a bit later, we start losing muscle, muscle fibers. And loss of muscle fiber is called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the age-related association of loss of muscle fiber. And we can prevent that by resistance exercise, by resistance. So weight training is very important. If you look at, if you do, a, if you do an MRI of a 20-year-old across the thigh, and count the number of, of muscle cells in a 20 year old thigh and, uh, and then you go to an 80 year old and count the number of muscles uh, in an 80 year old the 80 year old will have about 70% uh, uh, fewer muscle cells compared to a 20 year old and so it's not surprising that a, an 80 year old will be much weaker than a 20 year old part of the reason or the majority of the reason is that you have fewer muscle cells as you get older you can actually prevent the muscle loss, the loss of the actual number of cells, by, by resistance exercises. So preventing sarcopenia by reducing the number of cells that we all, muscle cells that we all lose is very important by resistance exercises. 
And for the final 25 years uh, of your life, it's balance and flexibility. So, you know, so what I tell people, you know, if you're going to, you know, so there are lots of healthy 80 year olds, uh, there are not that many healthy 90 year olds. Uh, but if you get to be 90 and you haven't got Alzheimer's disease and you haven't had a stroke and you haven't had some terrible cancer and you haven't got Parkinson's disease and you have nothing bad happened to you, what's going to do you in is going to be balance and flexibility. Inevitably, you're going to lose your balance and you're going to start falling. And so for the last 25 years of your life, what you, not, what you need to start working on is balance and flexibility because that's, that's where the disability. And Art Hister taught me this uh, eponym, BOF. You got a BOF, balance, aerobics, resistance, and flexibility. And so those are the, comp the components. And at different ages of your life, you need to do different things. So certainly uh, flexibility and balance the first and the last of both are very important in, uh, uh, in octogenarians and nonagenarians, but you certainly shouldn't um, uh, neglect uh, strength exercises to prevent sarcopenia. Just to make things interesting, uh, it turns out, and I don't know if I have any slides on this, but in the last year, 18 months, there's a tremendous amount of research that, that says about Alzheimer's disease. And we now have biomarkers which actually can um, uh, pretty accurately um, um, document the changes in the brain that occur during Alzheimer's disease. And so the biomarkers are, an, are the size of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of the brain um, that, um, that, that's involved in memory. And we know that people, as they get older, the volume, the size of the hippocampus gets less. But if you have Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus shrinks even more than normal aging. And surprisingly enough, you can bulk up your hippocampus by doing aerobic exercise. You can increase the size of your hippocampus by, by sweating on the treadmill or, working, or have, working up a good sweat. That doesn't necessarily mean that it stops Alzheimer's disease getting better because these are early studies, but certainly the, you, you, your hippocampus will increase in size. What that means is not clear. Another piece of evidence, which is another piece of supporting evidence, um, you can do CSF biomarkers. So if you do a spinal tap and measure some um, proteins in the CSF, there are two that are currently very fashionable called uh, um, uh, 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 um, alpha, um, amyloid and tau, CSF amyloid and CSF tau. And what you want is you want a high uh, amyloid and a low, tau, a, a low tau level. That's normal. With Alzheimer's disease, your, your, your amyloid levels drop and your tau levels go up. So that's a bad pattern. You can reverse that pattern to some extent if you exercise, aerobic exercise. That doesn't necessarily mean that your Alzheimer's disease is getting better or that you're getting smarter or aren't getting uh, as demented but it is an indication that something's happening in the brain. So there are two pieces of exercise, two pieces of evidence to show that in dementia, aerobic exercise can, or in theory at least, provide some structural changes to the change, uh, structural repair to the changes to the damage that's happening in Alzheimer's disease. So that's very, very exciting news. Um, but what it does mean is that exercise is really the key. And we, we need to give ourselves, our heads a good shake, and we need to really probably exercise harder than we thought we have, that, that we were, and we need to do it consistently. And the challenge, of course, is what do you do when, when it's easy to exercise when you're 25 years old, you drive a car, and you don't have any spinal stenosis, and you don't get short of breath, and, you know, and, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's much easier to exercise then. You know, what do you do when you've lost your license because of macular degeneration and you have some back pain and your balance isn't that good and blah, 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 blah. Well, I, I totally understand that. The challenge then is to, you know, is to work closely with your doctor, with a physiotherapist, with the community center, with the, um, with the case manager from, from, from Vancouver Coastal to develop an exercise program that's right for you. And then you've got to do it. You remember what I said about you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him exercise? You know, it's fair, you know, it's fair, you, know you can, 
uh, facilitate exercises, but people have got to do the exercises. So the American Academy of Sports Medicine is recommends taking a slow and stepwise approach that allow patients to reach attainable goals. 30 minutes or more of moderate intensive exercise five days a week, or 20 minutes or more vigorous activity three days a week. Vigorous activity should be rated 7-8 and should increase a large increase of heart rate. Uh, moderate uh, would be um, slightly breathless but able to speak. Vigorous is that you're breathless and only speak in short sentences, short words. Uh, and then flexibility and exercise, stretching after exercises. So I think you have to start low, go slow, have realistic goals, but I think motivation is key. Um, muscle strengthening exercise and balance include progressive weight training or weight bearing calisthenics. 10 to 15 reps of moderate to high uh, on two non-consecutive days. Balance initially taught, then continued as a home exercise program. So that's something which most of us can do uh, if we're motivated enough. It doesn't matter what exercise you do, long as you reach your target. Uh, even if sitting on a chair and vigorously uh, raising and, and stamping your feet to get your heart rate up would count as exercise. If you have a spinal stenosis and you can get hold of a machine which allows you to, uh, to row like, like that uh, to get your heart rate up, that would work as well. So it doesn't really matter. You c there are lots of ways to be adaptable. So the best form of exercise that I've found in my practice are ballroom dancing. People who, take who like ballroom dancing are colossally lucky because it combines absolutely everything. Um, the, I, I, had a, um, I had this patient who was 96 years old and he, her, his daughter was a, his daughter-in-law was a dietitian and she asked me to see him because he was getting short of breath. And so we said, when do you get short of breath? He said, well, when he walks up the three flights of stairs to uh, his uh, dance class, which was in Chinatown, he gets short of breath. So he had, uh, he had aortic stenosis, and um, people know, but basically now you have this magic technique which Dr. Webb can put in a, 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 a replace the aortic valve with keyhole surgery and blah, blah, blah. So now he's back, back, back dancing, so everybody's happy. So, so obviously it's a great result. And so uh, his, um, his family said, oh, that's wonderful, maybe I should see his wife. So I saw his wife, uh, and uh, his wife was 89, he's 97, and, uh, and she was fine, she had some minimal cognitive impairment, and I asked her to get, up, get off the bed, and she just jumped off the bed and like, leaped off completely fluidly and just without any disability whatsoever, because she's been ballroom dancing with her husband for the last 50 years. And it turns out that, I mean, like, and so ballroom dancing is really good because A, it's incredibly social and you go four times, three or four times a week and you have a group of people and, and if you're a man and you get lots of dates because there are more women than men <laughs> and so you get lots of dance partners and it's very social. Uh, it's good aerobic exercise because you certainly get your heart rate. It does coordination and balance. So it really has the full nine yards, it has, it's really the full meal deal of exercise. So this is a 101-year-old who just bought a Camaro. Uh, said, I always wanted a, uh, a sports car, Virgil said, who, who was turning 102 in January. He met with Ed Welburn from, Global, from General Motors. And so he told me, if I keep it for 10 or 12 years, it'll be worth about $100,000. He's very optimistic. Uh, and uh, Mr. Kaufman said, once in a while, I like to kick it up. But I'm afraid if I drive too fast and get a ticket, then they might take my license away. <laughs> That's a true story. So, um, so changes in lifestyle and medical care can prevent uh, or significantly postpone age-related morbidity. And there are many, many clinical clues that help to predict successful versus unsuccessful aging. And this is my hero. So uh, he said, Ms. Harold, as we get older, we sometimes begin to doubt our ability to make a difference in the world. It is times like these that our hopes are, uh, are boosted by the remarkable achievements of other seniors who have found the courage to take on the challenges that, that would make many of us uh, wither. Harold Schlumberg is such a man. Uh, what he said, I've often been asked, what do, you, what do you do now that you're old and retired? He said, well, I'm fortunate to have, been a chemical to have a chemical engineering background. 
And one of the great things I enjoy most is turning beer and wine into urine. <laughs> he should be an inspiration to most of us. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>